Welcome back to The Producer Podcast. I'm your host, Micah Versman, and today I'm once again joined by Aaron Burns. Over the years, Aaron has worked on a number of action-adventure films, including Beyond the Mask and Legacy Peak, and today we're looking at what a producer should consider when making an action-adventure film. So without further ado, let's get started. So thank you very much, Aaron, for coming back on the show. Absolutely. Glad to be here with you. Uh, maybe to start, because it's been a couple years since you were on. I know last time we talked, it was like during the height of the pandemic. So maybe like catch people up on what you've been up to. Sure. It has been uh, an adventuresome couple of years for us. So it just when the pandemic hit, we had three projects all you know instantly grind to a halt. Uh, as I know everybody else did as well, but then just saw some some wonderful provision that over the next couple of months took off and wound up helping um, a company to uh, develop a a film uh, that they're they're fun fundraising for. It's a true life story set in China um, in the 1850s. Uh, it's a very fun project. We got to help them develop that, and then did a bit of work for a pro-life group making some really cool uh kind of cutting edge scientifically uh and using 3d tools and things to create some animated short films for them that we were able to kind of do all that while everything was shut down in covid and then stuff picked back up and we uh, produced life mark with the kendricks and then directed my first feature uh which was called legacy peak in fall of 21 and then last fall, shot in fall of 22, directed a Western. Uh, it's currently titled Birthright. We'll see if that title sticks. But that was a another fun adventure. And then we're in the middle of post on that and development on several other projects. So it's been it's been a very busy and exciting season. You know, you mentioned how Legacy Peak was kind of your first film you directed. Uh, so like what things did you learn directing that project that have benefited you now as a producer? Um, yeah, that, that is a great question. And I felt like it, in some ways it was a giant learning curve going from producing to directing, but in other ways it wasn't that much because I've, I've been around it and I've been watching it so long and been creatively involved as a producer. Um, so there's some things that I liked about it that were that were easier. I, if I, if I wanted to make a change and just say, no, we're doing it this way. Uh, and, and <laughs> I'd have my producer hat on sometimes saying, look, we can't afford to do it this way. So instead of me coming and trying to convince everyone to change the plan, I could just make a producer decision to change the plan on the creative front. But what's interesting, uh, when you're talking with your producer team, you, you can give a motivation for changing things based on logistics and budget. But when you're talking to your cast, you say, hey, I think that your character would do this. Why? Well, because it's cheaper. <laughs> It'll save us time. <laughs> they say, well, hold on. <laughs> let's let's come up with a better reason than that. So um, it, it just, it's, it's funny wearing, you know, switching between those hats. Uh, as the director, your job is not to bring the movie in on budget and time, but to tell a compelling story. And that's your cast's job as well. Um, I would say things particularly that I, I learned uh, why different departments need different amounts of prep time and how to use your prep time well and what kind of things uh, to prepare for and what things to plan in advance. Um, and then even the the rhythms of a shooting day, you know, what a, what a director needs uh, versus what a producer needs. So just an example, I remember, you know, many times uh, on, you know, working with the Kendricks on a war room or overcomer or something, I would come up to Alex and ask him, you know, say, oh, I need, I need to, to bug him about something, a uh, question for next week. And I have the whole budget and the whole schedule open in my mind, and I can see all the details of everything. So then I go, you know, go up to Alex, oh, it's at lunch. I'll bug him for a second. Hey, Alex, next Thursday. And I just see this deer in the headlights look. And say, so, you know, next Thursday we have the big scene, you know, down at the racetrack. And he's like, uh, um, <laughs> what I realize now when I'm directing, 
you're sitting there at lunch. You just barely wrapped up the scenes that you finished and you're thinking through the details of, okay, do I need to go get another shot of that? And you're playing versions of the edit in your mind that I get the performance I need. Did my cast, uh, you know, is my cast queued up now for the next scene or can we go on? I see that the light has changed. Do I need to rewrite that piece? And you're all, you're very much dialed into the, the minutia and the details. So thinking about that, then back from the producer side, what can I do further to serve my creative team to take away those other other worries, you know, on their behalf um, and set them up for success um, in those details. Uh, so just, you know, wearing another person's shoes for a while helped me to have um, a, a better understanding of how those teams uh, can integrate back and forth. So definitely enjoyed it. I did some directing getting started when I, before I kind of went on the producer path, but I haven't stepped foot back into directing since. So probably would be a good learning experience even for me. It probably would. And it is interesting because my creative team would sometimes say, Aaron, stop producing, focus <laughs> on directing. You know, let, let's, let, let's make, we, we got to focus on this right now. You know, come back, come back, mm -hmm. um, which is, which is important to do. So, you know, you can wear both hats, but you really can't wear both hats at the same time. You have to take them on and off. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a, it's a fun challenge. Sounds like it. So I know last time uh, we talked, we kind of heard some of how you got started uh, just in general making films and what got you interested in some of your like historical films, like Beyond the Mask you did. Uh, but uh, I'd also love, because most of your films have had some form of action adventure element to them, like what kind of drew you to that uh, area of filmmaking as well? Yeah, for me, those were always my favorite kind of stories growing up. And I feel like one of the powers of storytelling is the ability to take you to a different time in a different place and to put you somewhere where you could never be and to take you on an adventure. So that for me is one of my core values that I love to bring to a film. And it doesn't have to be a, a huge action piece, but for me telling films that are timeless faith and family adventure stories, that's kind of the the world of, of storytelling that, that I most enjoy. Um, so yeah, just as, as a kid growing up, I loved the sense of adventure and playing in the backyard and playing with my siblings and cousins and my dad, um, you know, weaving my own stories is, you know, something I, as I grew up, there weren't that many adventure stories uh, that were in films that I felt were great fits for my kids. And so wanting to make films that you could sit down and watch as a family uh, mm -hmm. and watch with your kids that brought all those adventure elements to the table. Um, so anyway, that's a little bit of the inspiration for me. So then exploring the whole adventure film, action film concept, like as a producer, when you first get a script for that, like what things are you taking note of as you read through the script and start to do your breakdown to figure out like what this project is all actually going to entail. So there are so many different ways to approach uh, every element of a film. And I've, t I've was talking with uh, someone about this just the other day that, yeah, we could shoot Lord of the Rings for a dollar. Um, if I just turned on my iPhone and read the book into it, and I made the noises of Gollum's voice and I said pew, pew, for, the, for the explosions as they're attacking Helm's Deep, right? Um, but that wouldn't be a story that anybody would want to watch. So it's a matter of scaling the resources you have to the story that you're trying to tell and going back and forth. And on the projects that I've done, it's very much a collaboration between the script and the production elements you find. So as your budgets go up, an increased budget really gives you the opportunity to buy control and buy precision of this is exactly what I want. So let's get exactly this. When your budgets are more modest, you have to be able to find, you have to be flexible to what is handed to you, but then find a way to make that feel intentional. So I'll give you an example um, in the film uh, Legacy Peak, the original script uh, had this scene where they escape from a cabin in a snowmobile and there's wolves chasing them and they're racing the snowmobile and then they get to a river 
and the snowmobile skips part of the way across the river and then it crashes. Uh, and that's something that I've, I've seen happen. You know, I've seen snowmobiles skipping across water. It looks so cool. I said, well, we'd love to put this in. Well, there's a number of problems. One, in the state of Colorado, in the area we were filming with the Rockies, there are no rivers that are deep and wide enough to skip across. Second, the time of year we were filming in December, there wasn't enough snow to even drive a snowmobile. Uh, and then third, the amount of safety and rigging and stuff, it, if we had gotten to a river to be able to actually crash a snowmobile into a river, would have taken a half a day to pull off something like that. Um, and we didn't have the time and resources to devote to such a big stunt. So what we wind up doing is we, sm we switch the snowmobile to a four-wheeler, which can drive through a little bit of snow or if there's no snow, dirt. Um, and then we just we went to a creek that was on the location we were filming. They crash into the creek, flips, and you're in the water. And it worked very well. So, again, in my mind, do I wish it was a snowmobile? Sure. But, at a, you know, at a modest budget scale, it's taking the creative vision that you have for a particular sequence, what it needs to communicate to the audience, the experience you need to take your um, – you know, your viewers on and finding ways to mold it to the budgets that you have and make it feel intentional along the way. Kind of a branch off question there. Like, how do you decide when you're working with those modest budgets? Like, what elements are some of those things that like you're okay compromising on versus like, no, this needs to happen for the story to get the message across? That's a great question. And I think there's different people sit in different chairs. So there's the writer, the producer, and the director. Um, and on the last two projects um, that I've done, I've been producing, but directing as well. And that is easier in some ways when you're, when you're, Close, when I'm closely integrated with the producing side, because I know what this costs. I know if we're going into overtime for this shot, you know, and I know if we're hiring an extra person to pull these things off, I'm aware of the implications and mm -hmm. I can kind of synthesize those things in my head um, more quickly, uh, which I think that, you know, the, the directing experience makes me a better producer as well and, and back and forth because I can serve those different disciplines. But really, it's, it's a conversation between, um, between the team members because when resources are not unlimited uh meaning that there's if you do if you make one choice it will have implications down the line of what you can do it's making sure that for the big picture you're holding on to the things you need to make the story work and so in action films or in adventure films you have to have significant adventure elements and so a, a, a shorthand that i learned you know, years ago when we were making some of our first films, if you can have in the beginning of the film a really fun adventure set piece and put one in the middle and put one at the end, then your audience feels like they've gone on an adventure. If you if you kill one of those set pieces, you know, big bigger budget movies might have six or seven action sequences in them. Um, but on smaller budgets, can you keep the story moving along with drama and characters and things? and only give them three adventure set pieces, um, that usually works fairly well. That's kind of been the formula that, that we, we've we done with several films. Um, and then knowing that we need to have an adventure piece there, what what do the characters need to learn? What do they have to do? What do they have to experience in this adventure? Well, let's, let's lay those out, and those are the non-negotiables. And then from there what are the pieces that we can be flexible on? And what's wonderful is when you're working with a, a talented and dedicated team, um, your locations manager can contribute to that. Well, hey, I know this river over here. I know this building that we have permission to burn down. I know this you know, thing here that we could actually crash through this. Or, um, And then your stunt coordinator, hey, if we modified it like this, I could give you this production value and it would, it would be easier in this respect. Um, and then your your first AD as well can contribute to those conversations. So that's that collaboration, the director, the producer, and then those other key team members, um, you know, can can bring to the table uh, that conversation. And they say, well, you know, we are keeping this version of it, you know, the four-wheeler versus the snowmobile, keeps the sense of adventure that we need. It, it moves them through the story quickly. It gives them a chance to experience all the things they need to experience 
Um, and the audience will never know the difference. Now, if we said, what if they just walked and they trip and they fall into a lake? Say, well, you know, that's not really doing what we need to do here. So that idea won't work. Um, so that's what I do is I, I, I sketch out my non-negotiables um, and I try to keep them as few as possible to give the most room uh, for creativity, in, you know, in the development phase uh, to let other voices speak into it. So you mentioned uh, there how a lot of times like your stunt coordinator can kind of help figure out when you're dealing with what's non-negotiable and what is. So I guess I'd be curious to hear with like your experience, what should you be looking for in a stunt coordinator when you're trying to decide who's going to be the best fit for your project? Well, a big key is experience. Um, have Has a stunt coordinator done these, done the kind of things that you need to do before, or can they bring in experts in, in those particular fields to pull those off? Um, and obviously the, the biggest governing factor over the action and stunts is safety. Mm -hmm. And can, can we do this uh, in a, you know, in a way that keeps everybody safe um, while also recognizing the inherent dangers of what we're doing and to ride that balance between, no, this is, this isn't, you know, walking down the sidewalk, we're driving a vehicle really fast, or we're up in the air or we're doing something like this, but can we, can we create the feeling and the, um, uh, the experience for our audience of, of danger and adventure while doing it in a way that's, that is highly safe for our cast and crew. So experience is, is a huge part of it, you know, finding somebody that's done these things before. Um, and then communication, if they're a good communicator and able to work well um, with a team uh, and then have something that is key for me that I always love working with people is attitude. You know, do you have a good attitude? Are you pleasant to be around? Cause they're going to be trapped together for weeks and weeks. So if you enjoy working with them, uh, that goes a long way as well. So this is something that always comes to my mind, uh, but like you always see the videos that get put out of like the Tom Cruise movies of like him doing the crazy stunts uh, himself and that. So like as a producer working with like that stunt coordinator, how do you go about deciding like what do you actually let your main talent perform and where do you need to bring in stunt people yeah that is a that is a great question um and i think for most productions you don't so the there's two risks when you have when you're making decisions about actors doing things one is every person is a person it doesn't matter if you're a production assistant a stunt actor a stunt coordinator or the star of a movie every person is a person and we want to care for your body and your soul as you're working on our projects so just because you're a stunt person doesn't mean I'm okay with you getting hurt, right? Um, but there's a there's a so that's factor one. Factor two is the training of the person involved. So a stunt person, um, if they're experienced, they're, they're educated and physically trained on how to fall, um, and how to drive, how to climb, how to do these different things. And in the event that something goes wrong, they have the experience and the training to know how to safely get out of that situation. So if they're doing a stunt on a four wheeler and it starts to roll, they know to bail out and jump and let the four wheeler crash. Whereas an actor who's performing, depending on their level of training, they're more focused on their job is to focus on their performance and not on the safety of what's happening. So as you, as you look at it, um, we want to make sure each person is kept safe, but the ability to keep themselves safe is much higher for someone who's had more training. So an actor who's very experienced and trained in that area, like a, a Lucas Black, you know, has been has tons of experience driving. And so he, he was great, you know, driving the four wheeler um, or, you know, even with with handling firearms or things. Or I've had other actors who were natural, you know, grew up riding horses and were very comfortable with that. And you have other actors and actresses who, yeah, sure, I'll do the horse scene, but they're not actually comfortable with it. They don't have that personal experience. So that that's a, a, a big factor in it. What are we asking them to do? Do they feel safe doing this? Do they have experience doing it? If something goes wrong, do they have enough training to be able to get out of it safely? So that's kind of the risk to people side. The other thing to think about as a producer is a risk to your production that if um, 
a stunt actor gets whacked in the head and gets a big scrape across their forehead and a gash. Now, that's not pleasant, but it's going to heal up in a couple of weeks, you know, with a little Neosporin and a Band-Aid. The problem is if that's your main actor, um, now they have this scar on their face that you're trying to digitally remove or like SFX makeup it off. And that's a big problem, let alone if they actually break a leg and production has to shut down. So there is a, in addition to keeping your personnel safe, there's a level of risk to the project. Anytime you have someone, one of your main actors that if they're not able to do the scene, you have to shut the whole production down. So that, those are some of the different pieces um, that you weigh in there. Now, most often actors, they, they're they longing to do the stunts. And they'll beg, oh, please just let me do it. You know, I, I've totally got it. And so sometimes it's more of a negotiation of, well, let's let's talk to the stunt coordinator. Let's talk to the first AD. You know, let's talk to the guys who rigged this stunt and see what we can do safely. And if we can let you do it, um, then great. If not, then, you know, say if you don't have the proper training, then we'll let somebody else do it. Um, and that's kind of how we approach it. One of the things I think, especially for like uh, more first time producers that are getting into like action adventure that they don't always think about is one all of the like detailed paperwork that like film permits and that are going to want when it involves stunts and then the whole insurance side I guess maybe what are some things you've learned how do you go about making sure you have all that in place um so that that process is easy. As the saying goes, if it was easy, you know, everybody would be doing it. True. It is filmmaking is just brutally hard and there there's there's nothing about it that is easy. Um so what I would say is uh all of the mess of paperwork that you're going to have to do, you're going to have to do. It. And mm -hmm. you have to plan all that stuff, you have to do all that. So just give yourself time. But so what you what you need is your script locked. Uh, you know, months in advance, and then, you know, a plan of how you're going to approach a stunt scene. So there's there's an infinite number of ways to approach shooting any particular scene, um, but you have to have a plan in place so you can apply for insurance and describe what you're going to do. So, you know, man, uh, cra man crashes car into, you know, another vehicle and it explodes, uh, and then he jumps out and he's on fire, um, and then, you know, he, he jumps into a lake. So that's the sequence. You could shoot it with your main actor driving a car with a full camera in it and full camera setups of these things. And you actually then switch out for stunt double. The car actually crashes and impacts and then it explodes. And then the real actors, real, you know, stunts, all these pieces. Um, or you can do it through a wide shot where a car goes whizzing by. And then you have, you know, a GoPro shot slamming in, um, you know, into the thing. And then you cut back out to a super wide and boom, you see the explosion, or you could cut down to a close up of a tire and boom, you see the, the explosion happens off camera and you see the, the flame reflected in the, um, you know, in the wheel, the chrome of the wheel or something. Mm -hmm. And then you stay on that shot and you see feet tracking past and then a splash of water and the guy comes out. So there's an infinite variety of ways that you can shoot and cover anything and, and using a particular actor or a stunt double or, it's visual effects. So getting your script locked far enough in advance that you can then talk with your director and your um, locations manager and your stunt coordinator and your director of photography and plan out how are we going to do these pieces. And then you take that plan back to the insurance and they'll say, oh, this is all visual effects. You don't have to do anything. You're good. Or this is, you know, this is a substantial risk and all these factors. And this is the age of your actor. This is their experience. These are the licenses that you have, et cetera. Now with, you know, th particular things like fire um, and explosions and firearms, there are a number of different certifications that you'll want, you know, someone on your team to have. You might have to involve the fire department um, depending on the jurisdiction you're shooting in and those things. So really the more time, the earlier that you can plan out your action sequences, um, the more, ability you'll have to execute them properly one thing i was curious about just because you've done like legacy peak which was more of a modern day adventure film and then you've done like beyond the mask uh which was a period piece are there 
additional challenges that you've faced when you're making like a period action adventure film versus something that's modern day? Yes. Uh, a lot of those, uh, so, well, almost everything is impacted by the making the choice to go period. So locations, mm-hmm. Hey, this looks beautiful. Yeah. But there's power lines in the background or this building has, you know, vinyl, uh, vinyl siding on it, or, you know, we, there's so many things you can't use from a locations perspective. You're extremely limited. And then even if you're working with historical buildings, people are way more freaked out about you doing an action scene in, uh, you know, right next to or inside a historical building than they are in a parking garage. Right. Uh, so you're, you're limited by locations. Uh, you're limited by wardrobe, uh, that you can't, if you need a, you know, particular, group of background actors or if you need a particular stunt to happen well let's let's buy another two copies of the wardrobe so that the stunt uh you know the stunt guy would fit in because it's a slightly different size well in a period piece you might be hand sewing those to get your additional copies rather than just going uh, back to you know a a clothing store and and purchasing Mm -hmm. so locations um and then you know just thinking you're limited obviously by what is period appropriate so the kind of firearms that you would use you know the kind of vehicles that you would use and you know all of those different elements that again have to be planned in advance so uh getting your hands on a wagon that functions and you know a horse that is uh safe to use with your wagon and use around explosives and used to use you know guns going off and all those things is a lot different than a car so just thinking through very similar to the same elements you would bring into production, just thinking about those um, in that context as well. So I have a few kind of wrap up uh, questions for you. Um, the first one is what advice or things have you learned as a producer when it comes to working on multiple projects at the same time and making sure they're getting the attention they all need. That is the challenge. And I was just counting off in my head uh, the other day because somebody asked me, it's like, okay, I've got like, you know, five to seven projects, do you, depending on how you count them, that mm-hmm. you're all working on. Some of them are very low involvement. Some of them are very high involvement. Um, but this is an area that I'm personally growing in uh, and, you know, I have, have a lot of learning to do, how not to drop balls uh, when you're, when you have several of them up in the air. But I think one key that I've, I've observed in other people who do this really well is wherever you're at, be there and be present on the project that you're working on. And I've, I've seen people do that well. I've also noticed myself not doing it well, where I'm multitasking and texting and emailing at the same time I'm trying to have a meeting. Um, and if you do that, you know, you can do that a little bit, but if you do that too much, you you dilute your ability to focus. So focusing, even though you have seven things going, being present with the team member who you're supposed to be with right there. That's that's an area that I am, uh, that's an aspirational goal uh, for me to work towards that end. Um, and then also just being aware that overpacking your plate can be unhealthy for your family and for yourself. And so finding ways to balance that um, with you know opportunities. And I know one of the challenges of our space you might work on a project for months or years that doesn't pay you anything as a producer mm-hmm. you can't get it off the ground. And so if you only do focus on one project like that and it doesn't go anywhere for whatever reason, then you know you're you're in a financially untenable situation. So all of a sudden if you're working on multiple and then two of them or three of them are going at the same time, how do you balance that? So one um you know, not taking on too much, recognizing the challenges of that, but uh, working on teams as well is another key one. So I have several people that are um, very close collaborators and we do a lot of teamwork together uh, where, you know, I know you're handling these parts, I'm handling these parts and I can trust you to get those done. I don't have to worry about your job and I'll come back and I'll make sure that I'm responsible to do mine. So delegation and collaboration um and working with good people that, you know, can be partners for you can, can help in those areas. Just real quick, branching off of that, I'd love to hear kind of how you decide, like, what's something you can delegate and what's something that needs to stick with you? Because I know sometimes it's like, I 
totally could delegate this, but it's going to be just as much work for me to explain what needs to be done to whoever as opposed to me just doing it myself. That uh, this is now, Mother, this is a good this is a good and challenging question. Um, so for me, if it's something that I can train someone else to do and I can invest the time, if it's something that's going to happen again, and it, then it's worth the investment for me to train somebody else and walk them through it, because then I will never have to deal with it again. They do it next time. Uh, whereas if it's something that's a little quick one off and it would take just as long for me to do it as delegate it, then I'll, I'd be tempted just to do it myself. So on, I, I used to do um, the post-production supervision on all of my projects and I handle that and I would do that for other people as well. Um, but now I've, I have a, a guy on my team who's really good at that. And on Legacy Peak, I walked very closely with him, kind of training him and, and giving him time you know, to learn and grow and all these pieces. Um, and now, uh, and I did the same thing actually on LifeMark that I helped uh, another guy take over that post-production supervisor role. Um, but I was mentoring and training and connecting and stuff through the process. And then now next time, uh, I, I need to be involved less and less. So if it's a task that's going to repeat, um, then probably hand it off. If it has to do with, uh, so the second area is if it has to do with key relationships with people that would feel uh, put off by being delegated, that, you know, sometimes I want to honor people by taking the call myself or showing up to the meeting and, and honoring those individuals. I, and then maybe the other one is how critical, if there's a mistake in it, how big of a deal is it? So if it's an internal thing, and there's a few mistakes that's that you know a first timer makes, then I can clean them up later. But if this is something that a mistake would be a, a big problem, then I probably need to do it myself. Uh, so I don't know. Those are a few that come to mind. That's a that's a really good question and one I'll continue to think about. I guess the final question I had for you was, regardless of what position you work in the film industry, you always end up gone and on set for extended periods of time. So then what have you learned when it comes to like reconnecting with your local community when you get back from maybe it's two months, three months, and it's like everybody's like, oh, you didn't, you know, move to a new state or leave the church or whatever. That's a that's a good question, too. So I um, my wife and I have uh, four kids and we live in uh, Michigan, which is not a very big film state. I do basically no film work here. Uh, all of my work is on the road. And we discussed in the past uh, moving to another state to pick up more, you know, just to, to be closer to where we wind up working. Um, but uh, her family is in Michigan. A lot of my family is in Michigan. And a church that we've been going to, you know, uh, since we were kids, actually, my wife and I met at church, a different church, but then wound up, you know, our families attended the church that I go to now for, you know, decades now. Um, mm -hmm. and so we've thought about moving many times, but for us, there's a value in that we know these people and these people know us and we're just regular folks at church. Uh, that's not, there's nobody you know, trying to hit us up for business and jobs and those kind of things, which uh, you do when, you know, when I go visit other churches, it's like, oh, you're, you're a filmmaker. And, you know, do you know the guys who worked on this movie or that movie? And um, it, it just takes some of that simple community out of it. So that's a, a conscious choice that we made to stick in the community that we had and to try to invest there. Um, I also teach uh, a class my, when I'm home, I'm teaching a class at my church that gives me a window into those things to keep us involved there. And then we, we try um, when, again, when we're home and the season of life works out to have a family from our community over like every week, let them invite somebody over on a regular basis so that we stay invested and connected there. And it's a lot of work to do that. Uh, but we find that the value of not turning into a, uh, just for people on the road, we don't have any roots, we don't have any community, we're not in pouring into investing in others, um, and we don't have any accountability from a local church and local community. Those are, are dangerous places to be spiritually. And uh, so we've we've worked uh, 
to try to maintain that. And it's not always, um, it doesn't always work out great. Uh, you know, sometimes, and, and I, especially as my kids get older, cause they're ages nine down to two right now. And as they get older, you know, it'll be even harder for them to uproot for a few months at a time. Mm-hmm. But also on that topic for me, if I'm going to be gone for more than a week, um, I bring my family with me. So that's a, in the world of zoom calls, it's a lot easier to say, no, you know what, I'm just going to stay home and take that meeting as a call. Um, but sometimes, you know, you have to travel. And so I try to either limit it to a shorter trip that just I'm gone for, or if it's a longer trip, I take them. And I know not everybody can can do that. That's not an option for everybody, but it's something to weigh out and think about. That's definitely some good thoughts there. Those were the questions I had for you today. Thank you very much for coming on and taking the time to talk. Yeah, absolutely happy to, Micah. And thanks for being a part of our uh, production, uh, The Western, shooting with us last fall. It was a joy to have you on our team. Not a problem. I had a lot of fun. Definitely learned a lot on that one. Awesome. And on that note, we are going to wrap up this episode of The Producer Podcast. Make sure to subscribe to The Producer Podcast, and thanks for listening. Thank you.